Hello, church. Yeah, if, if that was louder than you expected, it was louder than I was expecting, too, for a second there. I'm just too darn loud. It's so great to see you all. We begin into our season of Lent, and we're going to be doing this in today in a way that you probably weren't expecting. We're going to start with some humor, if you don't mind. I think we need it. Yeah, someone said we need it, and I think we do need it. And so that's, uh, this, this gave me a belly laugh this week. But before I jump into that, I want to ask if there are any perfectionists among us. I, I, I think this is pretty much like a 98% church of perfectionists. Is that probably a good guess? Uh, how many people, show of hands, uh, liked to be at the top of the class whenever they could? Oh my goodness! Whoa! I think this is why we always feel so much pressure up here, because we know how smart you all are <laughs> and ambitious. I was also one of those people who liked to get to the head of the class, but the question is, why do we always do that? Even after school and other things are done, we still act as if the whole of life is somehow making the grade. And so we ask ourselves this morning, what is good enough? When we pare everything down, what is good enough? That is our theme for Lent. Now I want you to just imagine that Jesus was your professor. But Jesus as a professor uh, was disappointing because Jesus was not trying to make you as good as possible. Instead, Jesus confounded you with the way that he was a professor. And, and Amanda Lair uh, wrote these words she called in her fictitious piece, Selected Negative Teaching Evaluations of Jesus Christ. This is if Jesus were a professor, the negative teaching evaluations he might receive. One student wrote, Very inconvenient class. Always holds lectures on top of mountains in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, but never close to the main campus. Inconsistent attendance policy. Said we had to be in class by nine every day. Over half the class showed up late or didn't attend at all until the last meeting, but we all got the same participation grade. Another student wrote, he's nice enough, I guess, but he doesn't vet his TAs. They all provide completely different, conflicting lecture notes. <laughs> Tip, try to get into Luke's session, section. <laughs> By week one, I was already tired of his anti-rich, pro-Samaritan junk. I wanted to take a course in Christianity, not liberalism. I didn't, I didn't write these. Wears sandals too much. No one wants to see your dusty feet. Not what I expected. They say his area of specialty is carpentry, but we never built anything. I wanted to like this class, but on the first day he submerged us in a river instead of going over the syllabus, and that was kind of a lot. Two more. Feels like a class for farmers. Hope you like talking about seeds, wheat seeds, mustard seeds, 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 seeds. He straight up ghosted us. He took on the entire class as, as his advisees, got us all excited to work with him, and then immediately left for a 2,000-year sabbatical. Thanks for nothing. Okay, I know I have to add one more. This one was a zinger. A complete joke. Only got the job because his dad is important. <laughs> Jesus is the nutty professor. Jesus confounds us, especially for those of us who like to make the grade. Because everything about striving, even Paul talks about that striving, all of that striving leads us empty. We come hungry, even so. And so we ask ourselves, what is good enough? 
What is good enough for us to live a full life? Let's continue to be in worship together. Again, welcome to the San Ramon Valley United Methodist Church. For those of you who are online with us, we're so glad that you are with us today. We know that the majority of you who are attending are online, and so we don't forget you. Uh, Sarah is with you today, so if you have any questions, you can just put those into the chat, and she will help you to find ways to connect and to understand your hungers more. My name is Muntu. I'm here with all those who are leading worship today. I'm one of the pastors here. Welcome. Let's continue our worship this morning by singing together our opening hymn, which is Gather Us In. If you are here in person, please stand as you are able. For those of you who are online, please get into a posture that helps you to participate fully wherever you are. And our dreamings brought you to you in the light of this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken, gather us in the blind and the lame. Call to us now, and we shall awaken, we shall arise at the sound of our name. Not in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away, but here in this place a new light is shining, now is the kingdom, now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever, Gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in, all peoples together, fire of love in our flesh and our In our scripture today, it's important to notice that this is how Jesus begins his ministry. He begins it not in the way that everyone was expecting with some big miracle, but instead starts it off by going into the desert and preparing his heart. And so we're going to listen to those desert experiences. Many of you have heard this year by year. But as you listen, try to listen for your own sense of temptation. What are the temptations that have been going into your heart lately? And put those before God. Join with me now in the reading of the Holy Scripture. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were completed, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are a son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me and I give it to anyone I please, if you will worship me. 
this will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on a pinnacle of the temple saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of God for the people of God. Friends, would you please pray with me? Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God. You who are our strength, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. I'm going to warn you that the way that I preach this sermon today might make a few of you uncomfortable. And I'm going to apologize ahead of time. For those who are going to be most affected, I think that I have already warned you that this is coming. But Jesus made people feel very uncomfortable. And so that is why we are going to be doing a little bit of that today. But it's also part of the story and it's also part of my own confession. You know, Lent is a time for us sometimes to see those places where we fall short. And I'm going to share with you a little bit of where I was falling short in my ministry and where God did a little bit of course correction when I needed it most. So that's a part of where we're going today. Finally, we'll end up at the end of this time where I'm going to be talking about a person who changed my life. And it's a person who many of you are going to get to know. But I'll explain that more uh, as we get to the end of this. Let's begin with Scripture. Jesus confounds us. First, Jesus confounds John the Baptist. John the Baptist had said all these amazing things that this Messiah was going to do. He was going to baptize with fire. I baptized you with water. But it's going to be big. You know, Elijah kind of stuff, chariots of fire, kinds of stuff. That's what the Messiah is going to be. And instead, Jesus comes, probably takes off most of his clothing, and puts himself in the river and asks John to baptize him instead. And the Holy Spirit comes and blesses that moment. And that same Holy Spirit immediately pushes Jesus into the next phase of his ministry, which again is not what we'd expect. We would have expected him to do kind of what the wise people did when they looked for Jesus to go to the, to the rulers, to go to the head of the religious institutions. But instead, Jesus, instead of going toward them, he goes away from them. He turns his back. And he walks instead to the desert. Lent, in many ways, is our turning back and walking into the desert as well. And Jesus turns into the desert, and instead of becoming more godlike, Jesus becomes more human. Jesus faces his own temptations. Was it the devil, literally, that came and talked to Jesus? Maybe. 
Or maybe it's more like what we experience in our lives. When we empty ourselves and we listen, we begin to see not only the good stuff of our lives, but also some of the ugly stuff. The stuff we really wish weren't there. The things that we would rather scrape clean, like, you know, that stuff that gets stuck to your pans and the dish, dish, you know, and you're trying to get them ready for the dishwasher and it just won't come off. Those things that we just struggle with. What are the things that you struggle with today? If you were in the desert, what would God be saying to you? For Jesus, it was turning stones into bread. And then it was being in charge, ruler of all the world. And then finally, it was to test God, to see if God was real, if he could just throw himself off. The devil is saying these things. And then after that, Jesus comes exhausted at the end of that journey. And he is attended to, it, the, the Bible says, by angels. Could have been angels. I wonder if it could have also have been, perhaps, uh, and just in my imagination, maybe there was a shepherds who found him semi-conscious, laying on the ground in the desert. Maybe it was a group of women who saw him and saw his needs and nursed him back to health when he was on the brink. I don't know exactly what happened, but if we take the story literally, angels came and attended. And so the question I ask for you is, what would be attending to you? What are the hungers that you have today that only God could fill? Now, I have to admit, this is the confession part, that for a lot of my ministry, I just didn't get it. You see, I started ministry, and I've shared some of this with you before, so forgive me if for some of you this is a repeat. But I started ministry when I was 18 years old as a music minister. And so I was on staff from 18 probably until about 35, 38, continuously. And I forgot what it was like to not be someone up front. Being up front is really important. Nadia, Dewey, right? Don, it's, it's important to be up front, right, Pastor Cam? It is important to be up front sometimes. But it's amazing how when you stand up front for a long time, you forget what it's like to sit down in the pew or to be somebody who comes hungry for the word. Not because they have to learn some new dazzling thing that, you, you know, that they're coming in for, but because they're coming with real hungers and real needs. And in my life, it was I think about 2009 or so, I was the senior pastor of the Davis United Methodist Church. Some of you know it, not too far from here. And this was about the time that Heidi had finished her doctorate and was ready to start her work. And as I shared a couple weeks back, we decided that we would switch for a while and that I would be her support. And we would go to wherever her career needed next. And so I would become the stay-at-home dad. We had, we had our oldest daughter at that time. And so I exchanged this stole for a while. I'm having to pull this off awkwardly because it's stuck inside my wire. And I had to trade this out. And this became my new stole. This is the, this is, this is the actual apron, actually. I, it took me a while to find one that I felt was manly enough. You know, that didn't have beer written across the top of it. And in that time, I began to realize that people treated me completely different when I was this. When I was this, I began to realize that people didn't look up to me anymore. I didn't have any status. I was just the guy with the kids. And I was just the faculty spouse. I was the one helping the other people. I was the one feeding the, the medical residents that Heidi was teaching. And then I experienced something which many of you have experienced numerous times in your life, but I had not. 
for many years, I had to go church shopping. At least that's what some people call it. You know what that experience when you go looking for a congregation? Some of you, it's been a while. Some of you are doing that today, who are here today. And I had to remember what it was like to sit in the pew. This is the uncomfortable part. And sitting in the pew, I began to realize what it was really like to come to church. I, I noticed that some people were writing their grocery lists. Uh, some people were online. Uh, some people were completely distracted. But then I also had conversations with people around me. And I began to realize that when people come to church, they're not coming to be entertained. They're not coming to get smarter. They're probably already smart enough. Most of the time when people come, especially after a long time, it's because something has broken their heart. Most of the time I discovered that when people come, there's an emptiness that they're looking to be filled. Some of you might have heard the expression, each one of us has a God-shaped vacuum in our hearts. It's sometimes ascribed to Pascal. I, I don't think that he actually said that exactly. I think that morphed over time. But do you, do you have a God-shaped vacuum in your heart? So many of us try to fill that vacuum with so many things. We find ourselves living life as if all of life is clickbait. You know what I'm talking about, clickbait? Uh, on the internet, you know, when they, when they give you kind of like half of something and then they try to get you to click on it? Clickbait? Clickbait? Yeah, that's what that means, yeah. See, I'm here so I can hear what you're saying. This is a very strange perspective, I have to say. And, and being in the pew, I begin to realize that we really are all the same. That all of that division of being up front and up there is an illusion. Because all of us are coming hungry. And I was coming hungry. And when I was sitting in the pew, I began to realize that what I really wanted was just somebody to notice that I was there, especially when I was new. And someone just to lean over and say hello, remember my name, maybe. Uh, when we came with the guide dog and with Heidi, you know, with her guide dog coming in to the sanctuary, we just wanted to make sure we could fit because sometimes we couldn't fit with the dog. Uh, in fact, we went to one United Methodist church uh, and... We tried to fit in the pews down below. We couldn't with the guide dog. And so we went into the balcony because that was the only place that we could fit was in the balcony. But then we had a, you know, our, our, our daughter was three years old, I think, at that time. And she kept bolting to the front of the balcony and trying to jump off. And so I just, I just wanted some adult conversation. I just wanted a sense that, that, that God still loved me and that all was right in the world. And so we kept looking for churches, looking for people just that who would just be human with us, just say hello to us, and have a conversation and know that I was hurting. And finally, we did actually find a congregation where people looked at us and we could fit. And, and I had permission. Faith, if you're watching online right now, I'm talking about you, of course. Uh, we met Faith Marsali. Faith Marsali was a pastor of a friend's church, a Quaker church. Uh, I mentioned her briefly before, but I didn't hear her name. And in this Quaker church, a lot of the time we spent was just in silence. 
totally new for me as United Methodist because I'm a gabber. But they believe that the silence begins to help you understand, in a sense, that what we really need is God. And as the, our title here suggests, God is good enough for our needs. And then we listen for God's word in that silence. Could we do like 10 seconds of silence now? Amen. I have to come back up here because my back was starting to hurt. But sitting in that friend's church, faith would often ask us questions. And so often the sermon was not about what the person said up front, but what God was saying. And that was a huge learning for me. So I'm going to ask you this question. What are you hungering for? ask this other question. What are you tempted to fill that hunger with instead? It doesn't need to be a big thing. I learned that in this church, this little church of about 30 or 40 people in the mountains in southern Oregon. It doesn't need to be a big thing. We don't have to strive so much. We can just be open to what God has to say. So those of you who are doing the devotional along with us, we're looking at the book Good Enough by Kate Bowler. And on page 34, if you look on there, there is a story about Therese. I think I'm saying her name right. Therese, it's French, so I don't know exactly how she would say it. She was uh, born, I believe, in 1873 uh, in France. And at the age of four, She had a major loss. Her mother died of breast cancer. And rather than becoming bitter, she became this empathic young woman. And as a teenager, she decided that she would go and actually become a nun. And when she was there, she was just an ordinary nun. Nothing really special about her at all. And then when she was 24, just a few years later, she discovered that she had tuberculosis and was told that she would die. And she did die at 24. But before she died, she decided that she would use her limited time to do little things for the people around her. She called them, to call this her little way. So a little way was what she said. She had, and, and, and her thinking was that if anyone was mean to her or said anything mean, that she would just say something positive or gracious, something small, the little way. And she did that again and again and again. And after she died, she was remembered and eventually became a saint just from that little way that she dealt with her last year of life. I don't think it needs to be a big thing. Sometimes those little things are enough if people are coming hungry. So I invite you just to consider those things. Back to the last piece here. Faith Marsali, talking about hunger. Oh, I forgot I can take this off up here. Faith retired um, a little over a year ago from that small uh, mountain congregation. And when Faith retired, she found herself suddenly hungry. Because, you see, she had been part of that community but couldn't be part of that community anymore. She was making space for for the people after her. And so she needed something. Now, she was church shopping. 
all of a sudden. But it was in the middle now of the pandemic. And she was empty. And so, in a strange circle, Faith discovered us online. See, we've been doing this hybrid worship, and so people are kind of listening to us all over the country, all over the world now. We're hearing people from all over the world. We know that you're all from all over the world. And Faith was listening in Oregon, and she's been attending with us over the last year or so, Sunday to Sunday, faithfully. She's been sharing these pieces with us. And she has been being filled by you and by us as we have been worshiping together. And now Faith has said that she would like to, in a sense, return the favor. She would like to give also to the church that has been filling her for the last year. And she's going to lead a small group online after Easter on peacemaking because she was feeling that right now the world needs peace She's hungering for peace. And so if you are coming with that hunger today, I would encourage you to consider Faith's class. And I got to tell you, Faith is one of the most extraordinary pastors that I've ever met. And so I'm really excited that the same person that filled my hunger uh, through, through the Holy Spirit might get to fill some of your hunger as well. Let's continue to be in worship as we listen to this song that reminds us that small things are enough. It's a mama singing songs about the Lord. It's a daddy spending family time the world says he cannot afford. These simple moments change the world. Jesus knows you where you are One day at a time Live well Loving God and others as yourself Find little ways where only you can help With His great love A tiny rock can make a giant fall So dream small Just 
Just let Jesus use you where you are. One day at a time, live well. Loving God and others as yourself. Find little ways where only you can help. With his great love, a tiny rock can make a giant fall. Yeah, if I lose and two fish can feed them all. Good morning, or hello, I'm Pastor Kim Reisdorf, and uh, the message we just heard prepares us perfectly for the power of communion. If you're worshiping with us online, I encourage you to find a beverage and something to dip into that beverage. If you're here with us in person, you will come forward and um, receive the elements at the tables here. There's no hurry as you come forward We're, um, to take the time to take the cup and dip it in the juice and stay at that table as long as, long as you need. We remember as we take communion that Jesus served this meal after everyone had eaten, as if all that the world had to offer wasn't enough to fill the empty spots within us. And so we come to communion aware of the hunger we carry, knowing that the presence of Jesus, the presence of Christ, will fill that hunger. There are some truths in the world that need rituals because words alone are inadequate. And so we use the symbol of the bread in the cup to remind us of a holy, mysterious, and powerful thing, the presence of Christ, a divine presence, dwells here with us and within us. It's a powerful reminder that the little things, the little actions, the tiny bites, the single moments of taking in God's presence transforms us and heals the world. Ours is an open table you do not need to be a member of this church or of any church to come forward in order to receive communion. We simply come forward aware of the hunger and trusting that God will meet us in that place of hunger. And it's always appropriate when taking communion to say thanks be to God. So we begin by confessing our need. So join me now in the prayer of awareness that will be on the screens. Holy One, hear our confession. We carry big dreams, big egos, a big hunger to be recognized and applauded. We hustle for recognition and approval. Tenderly touch this need. Free us to do the little things with great love, now and always. Hear now these words of assurance. God forgives us. The miracle of forgiveness is that now, today, this moment, we can start over. We can offer ourselves emptied and vulnerable so that God can find a home in us. Together now, we will bless the elements with a, with a new liturgy, and your lines are in bold as we pray together. We gather together as a community. Wherever you are, together we give thanks that the living Christ dwells with us. Come, for we are invited to this holy mystery. And the people say, we are ready. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. All who come to me will not be hungry, and all who believe in me will never be thirsty. We are hungry and thirsty. We see the hunger and thirst in ourselves and in our world. Feed us now with hope and courage. We remember how on that dark night, that dark night of betrayal and loneliness and fear, Jesus offered the bread of thanksgiving and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
we remember how Jesus took an ordinary cup, filled it, and said, Take, drink, this is my life, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it and remember me. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Open our eyes to the mystery of Christ's presence in these ordinary things in our ordinary lives. May they be for us the very essence of the living Christ in our midst. Through the broken bread, we participate in the new life Christ gives. Through the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life Christ gives. Pour out your Holy Spirit on those gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. May the power of this holy sacrament fill the empty spaces, the sacred spaces, the grieving places in us, so that we leave this table ready to see the presence of God in all people, in all places and moments. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And that truth rings true as together we pray the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us ourselves as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You're invited to come forward. Take our bread, we ask you, take our hearts, we love you, take our lives. O oh, Father, we are yours, we are yours. Yours as we stand at the table you set, yours as we eat the bread our hearts can forget. We are the sign of your life with us, yet we are yours, we are yours. Take our bread, we ask you, take our hearts, we love you, take our lives, oh Father, we are yours, we are yours. Together 
When I fall down on my knees With my face to the rising sun Oh Lord, have mercy on me Let us praise God together on our knees Let us praise God together on our knees. When I fall down on my knees with my face to the rising sun, oh Lord, have mercy. Join me now in the prayer after communion. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Help us go into the world in the strength of your spirit and give ourselves in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We have been fed, and we have what we need in order to give, that all may be fed. Several times a year, we join in a, um, we join together with Methodist churches all around the world, because together we can do what can't be done alone, by pooling our resources. And this is one of those Sundays when we reach out to support the United Methodist Committee on Relief. It's one of my favorite parts about being a Methodist. And in our local conference, Steve Elliott coordinates all the activities of the United Methodist Committee on Relief. So he's going to explain a little bit about the power behind this organization. Welcome to UMCOR Sunday. Today is an opportunity to celebrate and support 
the missions and outreach of the United Methodist Church. The United Methodist Committee on Relief, known as UMCOR, is the humanitarian aid and development arm of our denomination. It operates in four major areas. Relief, such as emergency food and supplies in times of famine, drought, and geopolitical crisis. Disaster response, immediate and long-term support for natural disasters. Sustainable development, programs focused on areas such as clean water, sanitation, food security, climate change, and global migration, and global health, education and programs for priorities such as eliminating malaria. Examples of UMCOR's impact this past year include relief for Haiti's earthquake and tropical storm, Afghan refugee resettlement and humanitarian aid, and disaster recovery in the U.S. and around the world. Closer to home, we're grateful for UMCOR's commitment to addressing California wildfires. During the past five years, UMCOR has provided over $1.5 million for wildfire recovery, with more to come. All of this money goes directly to assist survivors and is matched by financial and in-kind donations from our California-Nevada conference. Supported by UMCOR training and sponsorship, our conference churches provide the boots on the ground for every disaster. UMCOR provides some of the supplies we use in our disaster response. This month, UMCOR is training the case managers for the Caldor fire. I hope you will consider giving generously to today's special offering. This offering is the means by which UMCOR funds their core operations. That way, when we have a specific designated need, say the recent Dixie fire or the tornadoes in Kentucky, 100% goes directly to that need not to operate UMCOR. Thank you for your support. So UMCOR is our boots on the ground, our hearts in giving, and we have now the perfect opportunity to see how it works because we have just opened up what we call an advanced special to help people in Ukraine. If you go to our website, and I think there's some, there might be something on the screen that um, welcomes you to be part of the recovery and response for the international disaster happening in Ukraine. Because of what you give to UMCOR as part of what Steve just explained, 100% of what you give to the advanced special goes directly to that designated area, not to any administrative costs. So this is your opportunity to give first to UMCOR and then to Ukraine, and you can do that in these ways. You can go to our website, you'll see the Ukraine colors, the blue and the yellow. If you click on that, you'll have all that information about how to give. And then you can go to our website and give to the special offering that is um, UMCOR as well. It's the perfect way to feed the needs in the world around us. Your donation, whatever the size, will be part of a much bigger way of being church in the world. So thank you. If you're here with us in person, there are plates as you leave the sanctuary, a place for you to drop off your um, donation. And there is also, uh, you can do it online at any time. For the joy that comes from knowing we've been fed, and now it's our opportunity to help others, we give thanks as we continue to worship.
Will you pray with me? Wise and loving God, we begin this Lenten season with heavy hearts. Not only are we reminded of the punishment that Jesus had to sustain, but in our own time, we witness an unwelcome return to war in Europe. From the Ukraine, we see images of people who have packed entire lives into a backpack and who, clutching the hands of bewildered children, walk their rubbled streets of their cities to an unknown future. Forgive us when we pretend that there can be no peace on earth. Encourage us to give of ourselves and our gifts, which will further the cause of peace and freedom throughout the world. Accept these, our gifts, in the name of the great peacemaker, even Jesus. Amen. As we move into living our faith in God's world, we have these opportunities to feed the hunger that we see around us. One is coming up next Saturday. We are hosting a workshop for parents so that they can help their kids during this time where there is increased anxiety and dismay and uncertainty. And so it will be here on campus. We have well over 50 people from the broader community registered. And I hope you'll encourage others to come. It's our way of being a blessing in the community around us. Again, it'll be here on campus next Saturday starting at 9.30. I would also encourage you to be part of a Lenten small group. It's for the next six weeks to find a way in community to go deeper in your faith. And you can find uh, all that information and all the groups that are open that are online, in person, and hybrid on our website. It's a powerful way to live and deepen our faith. Finally, I am, or another uh, way to serve is a 9 a.m. local time wherever you are. People around the world are pausing to pray for Ukraine. So picture that at 9 a.m., no matter what time zone they're in, people are setting their watches or cell phones to remind them to pause and pray. And we invite you to be part of that as well, wherever you are. We will continue to do that as we seek peace on earth. For those here in uh, in-person worship, please join us for fellowship time afterwards, a chance to catch up and enjoy a cup of coffee and conversation together. Next week, we are syncing our requirements about how to stay safe with the local public school system. So if you're worshiping with us on person, masks will no longer be required in worship. Many of us will continue to wear them in order to keep everyone safe, but they are, they are no longer required. But you know what is required next week? Any? Oh, someone got it right off the bat. Yeah, this is the time when we move, it's, uh, we move our clocks. Uh, you lose an hour. So uh, remember to do that so you don't miss a moment of worship as we gather next week. Extra credit for um, knowing that. May all of us um, live into this hymn as a type of prayer. It's hymn 454, Open My Eyes That I Might See. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Spirit divine, open my mouth and let me hear. 
voices of truth thou sendest clear. Adown I to thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my ears, illumine me. Spirit divine. I think so many of us came hungry today because of all of the pain that we are seeing in the world right now. I think many of us are hungry for peace. We're desperate. We're desperate because we don't know what will come next. But we're also reminded as we see those images that everything that we assume is important can be gone like that. We cannot take it for granted. So what is good enough underneath all of that striving? What is good enough for you? Remember that underneath it all, the one who fills the void loves you deeply and is ready to bring healing. God is with you. Go in peace. Amen.